Well, good morning, church. Um, it is good to be here this morning. Adam is out this morning. Him and um, David and the youth ministry went out to Winterfest this weekend to be with a ton of teenagers. I don't know if anybody's ever been to Winterfest, but it is packed in Gatlinburg this weekend. Uh, there are so many teenagers that go out there, and um, they went this weekend, and um, they're having a good time, I'm sure. And uh, But we are going to miss Adam for sure. And you got the stand-in this morning, so we'll do the best we can. Let's pray for those teenagers and all them at the Winterfest they learn about God. Father, I pray, God, so much, God, for these teenagers out there this weekend. Lord, be with all those, God, who are learning to grow in the Word. Father, it's such a crucial time of life, and, and I pray for all those. Be with Adam, be with David, and be with Livia and Natalie. Lord, as they help these teenagers grow and fall in love with Jesus. Father, we thank you so much for the church. Pray for this time, God, where we can open up your word. Father, we can really dig into this, God, and just learn more about you. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' awesome name. Amen. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2 is where we're at. So when I was about 10 years old, 10 or 11 years old, um, lived in Eden Shade, Arkansas, a little small town. Like I've told you before, about 397 people in Eden Shade, Arkansas, we were four of them. And so we were, um, one day, Saturday afternoon, where mom always did the laundry. And what's interesting about her doing the laundry, and I'm not, I don't see it much around here. But she still today puts clothes in the clothesline. I don't know. Does anybody still do that around here? Anybody close? All right, cool. A couple, not many. Well, she still does that. Well, I will never forget. When I was really young, it was a really, it was a nice Saturday afternoon. And she comes up and she's taking the clothes off the clothesline outside. And she puts it there and she gets in the basket. She puts it on the deck. She can see me through the window about 20 feet away. I was in the kitchen. I was walking by with... You know, when I was walking by and I, I saw her and she stands there and she goes, David, can you take this for me and bring it in? And right there, I had a thought, I don't have to do this. I could sit there and go, uh, no, or I could go get it and be the nice kid I could. Well, I looked at her, she said, she looked at me and she said, David, come get the laundry. I don't, I don't say a word. I don't say a word. I just quiet. And then all of a sudden she says, David, come here and get the laundry. And I go, nope. No. Well, she, she puts it down. She didn't even, she doesn't even take it with her. You see her leave and she runs around the, the, um, the, the, the um, porch, comes up the porch. And when she's up the porch, she runs in and I, I'm standing there. I'm like, what's going on? And I, I, I stand there and she is, he's, she's coming to me and she's got this switch. And she's grabbing on the way, she's running with the switch, and she's getting this. And I'm sitting there, and I call for my brother. I go, Justin! And he runs in there, and he goes, what's going on here? And she goes, Get, she moves him out of the way and just wears me out. She wears me out. Now, I remember that story because there's a time where I will never forget how defiant I was. How I didn't want to be told what to do. I didn't want to be told what to do. You see... I believe this, no one likes to be told what to do. No one. James Dobson speaks of two different categories of children. One is the compliant child, and two is the defiant child. He speaks that there are twice as many defiant children as compliant. Surprise, surprise. They learn rebellion. Children learn rebellion at a young age. but. Here's the note we want to get this morning. This is not limited just to children. This is not limited to children. I believe this continues through our lives. We have the choice, obviously, to resist authority or comply. Now, many of us, and we're good ab abiding people, that we're not going to just resist authority, but there's times where you might be told what to do your job. You might be told to do even, with, you know, maybe something in your home. You're like, I don't know if I want to do it or not. It's natural. Isaiah 53, 6 says this. It says this. We like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. You see this in the Bible, throughout the Bible, of, of situations where we decide we don't want to do it anymore. We don't want to do it. 
You see, however, without submission, there is no safety, there's no security, there's no protection, and then I want to add something here. And there's no music. Let me explain. There's an article I was reading this week in the American Psychological Association. I was working on a sermon. I thought, man, let's see what he's talking about. Submission. And this one said this. It's one of his members named Jack Lipton. Described his colleagues of a symphony orchestra, how they perceive one another. How different people, different groups in the symphony perceive a different group. The percussionists are seen as insensitive, unintelligent, hard of hearing, and yet fun-loving. That's what they're known as. The string instruments were described as arrogant, stuffy, and unathletic. The brass players were described as just loud. Just loud. And then the woodwinds, they were held at the highest esteem when described as quiet, but meticulously, though a bit egotistical. This is the mentality of this symphony, what they perceive other ones uh, alike. I have to ask the question, when you have a group of people with such different personalities and perception on how on earth, how on earth are they going to make music? How in the world can all these people make music if everyone looks at them differently, if they, they are perceived differently, if they choose to go a different direction? We all know through submission. When they submit their feelings and, and their biases to the leadership of the conductor, there's beautiful harmony. And that's what happens with submission. When we as Christians could put aside our differences, put aside our mentality, what we think is right, and start realizing what's right in God's eye, then there can be peace, there can be music in this world. As we've been seeing in First, in first Peter, we're seeing here how many, how these Christians are observed by an outside world and the kind of accusations that are being made of. We see this all throughout this book we've been studying the last few weeks. We talked about last week about how we are a royal priesthood. Adam brought this up, but we are a royal priesthood. He's telling these Christians, guys, you are more than what you think, despite what the world says. We read in chapter 1 about being holy, that you are set apart. Yes, the world, the people are going to put you down. They're going to do this stuff. But stay your course. So let's look in our Bibles. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse 11. Let's read this real fast. It's the word of God. Pay very, very close attention to these words. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires, which war against your soul. <laughs> Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits us. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by Him who do right, or sent by Him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Honor the King. Those are heavy words to to, to read. And many times we read this, we go, okay, it's just submit to the government. It is way more than this. Let's dig into There's four principles we're going to see in this. The principle of submission, the particulars of submission, the purpose of submission, the practice of submission. We're going to see those. The particulars of submission of who are we to submit to? Who are we to submit to? The purpose is why are we to do it? Why are we to do this? So let's break it down. In verse 13, he talks about submit yourselves for the Lord's sake. The Greek word there is huotasso. And it means this. 
This word means to arrange in order of soldiers under the ranking commanding officer. But it's interesting, this is a military word used in a non-military sense. It speaks of voluntary cooperation or helping someone carry a load. As believers, we are to be known as model citizens, and not troublemakers. But I, I want you to understand this. Before you get weird about being a model citizen in the U.S. government, which we're going to talk about, let me, let me remind you of when and what's going on at this time, when this book was written. When Peter wrote these words, there was not a democracy in Rome. It was horrible. He said, people did not get to vote. No choice in what any matter. There was no free speech at all. You could not do that. Caesar made the rules, and no matter what he did, you had to abide to them. So Peter's writing to these people who want to honor the king, submit to it. Now, that sounds a little far out there. That sounds a little far out there. Let me put it this way. Caesar Nero, who was at this time, we're going to talk about in more detail in a second, he was, he was at this time. And once a year, a person in Rome, every person, had, would have to come and go, walk up to Caesar, put incense in a bucket, and in front of him say, Caesar is Lord. Once a year. And you can see the problem, especially as Christians. Because they would say, Jesus is Lord. They were persecuted in a major way. Paul or uh, Peter writes about this also in, in so many ways. He says, guys, there was slavery in Rome, in the Roman Empire. Interesting stat about Rome, um, slavery is this. There were three slaves to every one free person in Rome. Half the population were slaves. And then you've got the taxes. And if you think it's bad now, here, it was absolutely oppressive. It crushed people. It was a form of uh, social cruel injustice. It's a form of cruel injustice. And what's interesting, this was the time Jesus came. You see, Jesus was under this and the growth of Christianity coming through this. But notice as we see in the Gospels that Jesus never told his followers this. You never see it in the Gospels. And you don't see it through Paul or Peter. It's Jesus never told his followers to pick it or march on Rome to protest a cruel government or even bad mouth the government. Never said it. Never went there. He never tried to win a culture war at all. Never did. And this surprised so many people. He's like, everybody's going, Jesus, but this, this, this. And you know the story that there was two groups of people that came and trapped Jesus one time. The Pharisees and the Rhodians. Now the Pharisees hated Rome. They hated Rome. They hated this oppression. They were the, they were, remember, they were the dignified Jews. They were the ones who were by the law. And this Rome was not right. And then the Herodians who thought it was okay to follow Rome. They thought, well, that's, that's okay. So both of these people who could not handle Jesus go with Jesus at one time. They go to one, they go to him at one time. And they say this to him. You know the story. Hey, Jesus, Son of God, or if that's who you say you are, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? Is it lawful to do that? What does Jesus say? Whose face is on it? Well, it's Caesar's face. Give what to Caesar is Caesar, and give what to God is God. <laughs> this is a critical moment. Jesus is not protesting this. He did it. Now, he could have, but he did it. You see also at the same time the zealots who at, at this time, and you see in the time of, um, in the Gospels, that they staged, they were so crazy minded that they would stage terrorist attacks based on scripture. And it would go all the way, if you want to look in the Bible in Deuteronomy 17, that they believed they had the right to disagree and, and, and with the government and disobey it. 
The zealots were this way. So you had the Pharisees, Herodians, and the zealots all looking at this totally differently. So my question is this this morning as we're getting into it. So what is a Christian supposed to do in this type of world? In 2020, in this, in this world, what are we supposed to do? Well, Peter says a pretty, pretty obvious. Submit. Oh, submit. Look in your Bibles in 13 and 14. Look at it again. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as supreme authority or to the governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. When Peter wrote this letter, he was about one or maybe two years away from the great persecution in Rome. And as you might have heard, heard this story before, a huge fire broke out. A huge fire broke out in Rome, and many historians actually believe that this was created and started by the Emperor Nero, who is in this picture, a statue of. As this fire just swept through the, the city of Rome, people were going, but Nero, you're the one who did this. You're the one, what? You need to. Well, Nero had to control this, and so he used a scapegoat. And who was the scapegoat? You, the Christians. And at that point, he said it was the Christians who were doing this. And they had to believe. And because of that, he rounded them up. Children, women, and men rounded them up and persecuted in mass. And what's interesting also about Nero was this. I don't you might have not known this or whatever, but Nero thought of of himself as a race car driver. Yeah. Nero thought of himself as a race car driver. Not a car, but a chariots. And so he built a track. He built a track. And this track, oh, no, there you go. This track, need, he needed this at night. He needed this track at night so he could watch the chariots go and get all excited about that. And so, and because of there was no electricity, the soldiers gathered Christians and gathered, covered them in tar and pitch, tied them to poles and lit them. And these Christians were burning so that they could enjoy the races. When I got to go in college to um, Rome and to the following the, the um, life of Paul, we got to go to Circus Maximus, and now it's great, it's a grainy picture. But you can't really tell because it's all weird. But uh, there's people walking this track. Now, it's just a walking thing. But if these people knew that this is where Christians died for, for no reason. This is what was happening at this time. So how are Christians supposed to submit to this government? As Peter's saying. You see, we have them in our world. Years ago, a man who we all know, Adolf Hitler. We, have, we had Saddam Hussein. We have Bashar al-Assad. Who are these? People that do not like us. Which brings us to the question, is there a time a Christian can or should defy and not submit to the government? Yeah, absolutely. The general rule is, is submit until submitting to earthly authority makes you not submit to the heavenly authority. Put it this way. <laughs> you obey until your disobedience makes you disobey God. Makes you disobey God. Examples we see in the Bible is when in Exodus chapter 1, Pharaoh wanted to round up all the babies, all the boys and kill them. Round up all the babies and kill them. What did the midwives do? Remember? The midwives did this. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. They defied the government because this was beyond a call. This was against everything. 
You see this also in a, a story we studied a year ago about Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar who made the people eat these foods that defied Jewish understanding and, 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 and the idea of it. And Daniel said, no, I'm not going to do that. He also, we read in Daniel the story about, he says, you will not pray anymore. Well, do you submit? Go, yeah, I, I better not pray. Daniel prays anyway. It's disobeying God. I'm not going to do. And then the statue of, the, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, not bowing to it. When the whole government says bow down to it, they don't. You do obey until your disobedience makes you, makes you disobey God. But this... This was the time we see in the Bible, but now we see it today. This isn't just then, it's today. As it passes abortion laws, same-sex marriage laws, all these perverted and, 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 and immoral acts and laws, we don't do. It's against what God wants us to do. So are we gonna be are we gonna be confronted by this? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, and as we know, and like I've told you before, one of the Daniel stuff, I'm 41, I can see a major change in 40 years. I can't imagine those who, who are older than I. It's, it's going fast. The question is, am I going to obey God, or am I going to do what they say? And in this, so we go to this point, the purpose of submission. Verse 13, the purpose is very clear, look in 13 again. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake. For the Lord's sake. Also, verse 12, he says, So that they may see your good deeds and what? Glorify God. That's why we do it. We follow God first. But we submit to the authorities. But parents, don't you love it when, you're, when your children obey? Don't you just love it when your children obey? Have you ever had a child not... Not say. Have you ever had a child that, whenever he said, "Hey, do this," and they say, "No," how does that make you feel? Like, what? I can I can help you out. I know what's best for you. Or how how do you like it when you tell your children to do something and they do it? Like, thank you. It will help you in the long run. I know I have the wisdom to go ahead on that. Verse 15 says this. It's very interesting because very seldom, well, let me read verse 15 or fast. It says, For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. I like this verse because very seldom something comes as obvious as this the will of God. I've heard many people ask me, What is the will of God in my life? What, is, what do I do in my life? How, how do I know if this is in the will of God to, to make me a better person? Well, it's, it says it right here. This is the will of God. So let's start by doing this. Going in the speed limit. Let's start right here by stop texting and driving. That's following the, what we're seeing here. He said, follow that. That is following the Lord's will. Let's start there. We see it by submitting to the authority. Paul writes in, in, in um, Romans 13 verse 1. says this. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. There is no authority except that which God has established. I love that part. God established it. Okay? The authorities that exist have been established by God. See, I never say, I never said, don't you don't have to like your government, but to honor it, what we do. Submit to it. You have the right not to like the issues or certain things going on. You have that right. There's no doubt about that. You can choose, like, I don't like that. I don't, that's fine. But we're to honor it, no matter which person's there. Because we are a higher authority. We are not of this world. This is not our home. It's not our home. You see it in, 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 the, in Romans. You see First Peter submit to it because people are watching you. People are always looking to you and us to find dirt on us. People are. 
I'll tell you what, it's interesting. You can watch the news or whatever. And when a Christian does something wrong, it is like a blown out of proportion. But anybody else, you can do that. The world's watching us. The world's watching us. To find a reason not to believe in God. And we believe in And they'll trip us up to do this. One of the best witnesses we can be is just be a good citizen. Just be a good citizen wherever you're at. If you're in the United States here, if you're in, you're in uh, wherever. France, wherever. You are a good citizen of that country. Because God put that government there for a reason. And we follow God. And then the last part is this. The fourth part is the practice of submission. And it's in 17. It shows four parts in this verse. Look in verse 17. Show proper respect to one another, to everyone, he says. Love the brotherhood of believers, fear God, honor the king. First thing he says here, show proper respect to everyone. Who is this? All people. Every human being deserves a certain amount of respect, whether they hate you or hate our God. Or practice a certain lifestyle you don't agree with. We respect human because they are a child of God. They are a child of God. You are seen here at 17. That is what you do. See, Peter wrote this in a time where, where people were not even considered human beings. Women had no rights. They were just out beyond. They weren't even considered part of society. Anyone considered a slave and no part of it. So here, Peter writes to the people saying, treat everyone. Show proper respect to everyone. Even if you don't agree. That's hard to do sometimes. It's hard for me. Hard to do. Number two is love the brotherhood. Who's that? Who's the brotherhood? We are. We are. You're it. Jesus says, by this all men shall know that you are my, my disciples by the love you have for one another. He says, they will know by the love that you reflect off one another. All these, the, wor all, the whole world is watching you. What you put on Facebook, what you put on Twitter, what you put on <laughs> social media. They're watching you and they're finding something. Now we can sit back and just show respect, love the brotherhood no matter what happens, that you might see it differently. It doesn't matter. We follow Jesus, we believe in the resurrection, and we believe he's coming back for us. That's all that matters. But this verse that Jesus says, by this all men shall know that you are my disciples, by the love you have for one another, it's a very interesting verse. Because if I was looking at this this week and I thought of this, essentially... Jesus gives the world outside, the outside world permission to judge us. Look at it. To look at the lives. To see if the gospel we preach and we talk about really works among the people. Jesus says, go ahead. Judge them. So, it's, we, got a, we got a high standard. How are we going to react to this? Is the world going to see us know that God is number one? And that we will submit to our authorities. We want a love, church, we want a love so compelling here, not just to Central, but among this nation. So that when people visit, they go, I want to be in that family. I want to be a Christian because of this love. I can remember when I was in high school, I had a good friend named Blake Nicholson. And man, I loved going to his house. And he had four wheelers, he had the whole outside thing going on. And he was awesome. He had an area downstairs, we would play this football game that I don't know if you remember, it was like a 10, um, 
I don't even know how to say it. Like a board game, but it was tin. You could plug it in and it just vibrate, and the players would just kind of move around, you know, whatever. Old game. And we used to play that. His mom would come down there and just, hey, how are you boys doing? You guys doing all right? We used to love that. She would get up and make breakfast for us when I stayed at night, and it was great. And I thought, man, I wish I was in that family. <laughs> I used to think, man, why can I be a Nicholson? And the same mentality is what we should have as, as children of God. Are people seeing us going, I don't want any part of that? Or are they saying, I want more of that. I want more love. I need it in a world that's so oppressive and so conniving. We as Christians, with our love for one another, make an influence, witness who Christ is. And we have the opportunity to do it this morning. I don't know if you're visiting this morning or not, but we are glad you're here. We are. If you're not a Christian, this is an awesome time to be a Christian. The next thing is this. Fear God, he says. Fear God. This obviously is not a scary fear. It's a respect and awe of God that creates an obedience that is directed toward him. It's, it's a fear, a healthy fear. Now, I, I've heard and I, I've seen this in my life walking as a Christian through ministry, that there are situations that people are scared of God. I, I don't know about you, but I'm not scared of my dad. I'm not. And he would be totally offended if I said, Dad, I love you, but I'm so scared of you. And why? I just love you. The same way as to our Heavenly Father. We fear. We respect Him so much. We fear Him that we can't help but be obedient to Him. The last thing is honor the King. Honor the king. This ends full circle. Because in verse 13, he's dealing with an action. Submit to the authorities. Submit to the authorities. But now, in verse 17, he ends it with an attitude. He ends it with an attitude. You see, you could do something and have a, rot and have a rotten attitude. Like you can have a child, and the child you can say, Hey, son, sit down. And that kid just... Ugh. He looks, just kind of like snarls, and he goes. <sighs> he sits down, and he looks at his dad, and says, I may be sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up in the inside. That's not honor. <coughs> it's obedience, but not honor. It's the right action, but not the right attitude. And Peter puts this together right here. He says, you submit to the authorities. The police department, the fire department, your senators, your government officials, your president, you submit to them and you honor them. You honor them. But you look in this tense in the Bible, but you, how are you supposed to do this? You can hear the Christians read this. Go, how do you do this? This is Nero. This is the one who hates. How do we honor someone who's killing us, who has killed my family? God will give us that power because this is not our home. Be careful on how, let me back up and say this, we honor our king. We honor our authorities. We honor. Be careful how you talk about our governing authorities. Be careful. You can disagree with them all you want. Sure, whatever. You can like them. But whether it's your president or whomever, they are to be prayed for and to be honored. Because they are in a place, according as far as I can read it, in Romans and 1 Peter, they are in a place, according to the Bible, where God allow, allowed them to be. Okay? So how are we going to do this as a church? How are we going to make, like I said to start out, music together? This beautiful music. We have so many differences in personalities, ideas, political nature. How are we supposed to do this? Well, by submitting to the Lord. Submit to Him first. <laughs> and honoring our, our government authorities. As we march in unity, you can, you can say, I don't feel like doing that. I, don't, I can't handle this. I can't. Oh, I didn't, you, you don't have to feel like it. Just do it. And you'll discover that your emotions will catch up to your obedience.
telling this to these Christians. You do it. We have no government that's killing us. But we obey. Until we dis start disobeying God. Then we, we follow Him first. You, by, 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 by doing this, you will find yourself honoring God and honoring our government authorities. When I was, like, I, I have to say this story because I just is so excited about this. That year ago, year and a half ago, interesting story. You guys know that there was a time that me and Jessica got to go to the biblical lands. And as we were at the biblical lands, it's an interesting story because I see this play out. We were on the Sea of Galilee. Picture of it. And, and right here is where Jesus pulls his apostles up together. Right off the bat in Matthew chapter 5. And he sits with them. He sits with these guys ladies, and he does a Sermon on the Mount. And as he's on the Sermon on the Mount, which is right around here, he said this, you are the light of the world. You are. Church, pay very close attention to this. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. When you're around the sea, it's these mountainsides. And there's this city, you can almost see Jesus sitting here with these guys and going, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. Shine your light in a way that they may see your good deeds. By how you submit. By how you say yes sir. By how you pay your taxes. By how you, you treat the police department. By how you how you honor the honor the president, honor the vice president, senators, whoever. They will see your good deeds, and what will they do? The Bible says they will glorify God in heaven. Jesus knew this, and Jesus knew by how we submit that will be one of the greatest witnesses we will ever have in this world. I. I've I don't know if I've ever done this. I think I did it maybe a few years ago when I think about it. But we're going to pray for our leaders. And I know this is a climate, we are about to enter a climate of this nation in 2020 that it can be very, very interesting. But no matter what happens, God is king. And he deserves everything. We pray for our president, vice president, police, mayor, city council. Pray for them. Help. We, they are put in there to help. And, I, and the more you do, you'll discover that hate cannot well up in the heart of someone who prays a prayer to honor a loving God. This morning, let's pray for these people. Father, as we read these scriptures... It, it's tough to preach about, just to be honest with you. It's tough to preach. God, we are such a hypersensitive society now, Father, and we are so sorry. Father, I pray that, God, we can understand that as we read these scriptures, or that we submit to the, the authorities and we, we, we respect them. Father, we, first of all, I want to pray for our police department here in Athens. We are so thankful for them. We are so thankful for them. Lord, be with all of them in what they do, God. Help us, God, to respect them in what, whatever happens, God. Father, be with our president, Donald Trump. Bless him, God. We pray for him. Pray for our vice president, Pence. Bless him, God. Father, we pray for our speaker of the house, Nancy Pelosi. Bless her, God. Father, we ask a blessing upon that Congress. Father, for Schumer, we pray a blessing upon him. Father McConnell, we pray a blessing upon him. Father, we pray for our senators here in Alabama. We pray a blessing upon them. And God, I pray that you just help them, God, govern the best way they see fit. God, help us never to be so tied up into 
this that we forget there are souls out there who need saved. And Father, we are more than citizens of America. Father, we are citizens of heaven. And Father, help us to believe that and understand that. Father, we are so thankful, God, that we live in this country. Lord, despite whatever situation or whatever things we go on, God, we can still get up and go to work, love our families. We're so thankful for that. So God, I pray that, Lord, as Christians, God, here in this nation, here in Alabama, God, we can represent you first. But God, just as we have read, Father, Lord, help us to submit to our government and honor those who are above us. The world's watching, Father. We know that. And Lord, it's stressful times. But God, I pray that everything we do, our words, our actions, will give you glory and you glory only. Lord, you are our king. Lord, we thank you so much for Jesus, who is above all. And it's in his name that we pray, amen. This morning, if you have anything in your heart, your mind, Maybe you just need to respond in some way. You can come now as so we stand and sing.